introduction of myself and my husband. My husband sitting in the front row. Roger! He is, he is what I would call your typical drone. He is sitting there and allowing me to do the work as I make the presentation. But that's okay. Drones are very useful. They'll use at the end. Briefly, <laughs> briefly useful. Briefly useful. Absolutely. So anyways, um, a little introduction of who we are and why we're here and why we're talking tonight. So Richard is the two-time president of the Palm Beach Native Plant Society at its commencement in 1981 through 84. Um, 1984, he was appointed the Florida Exotic Plant Council, 85 or 95, the Natural Areas Management Advisory Committee through ERM. He co-authored a book on plants, Xeric Landscaping with Florida Natives. 2016, Audubon Sanctuary Manager for Bingham Island, and 1984 to present day, he is the owner of Mesozoic Landscapes Nursery, which is a native nursery. He is also, in my opinion, one of the top botanists in the southeast region of the United States. He has worked with Fairchild and even gone to uh, New Caledonia on botany tours. Um, and so this is an actual expert. He, uh, at the end, will help with questions. Um, myself, uh, 1989, nursery owner, landscape designer, installer for Lorax Designs to present day. 1997, initiated and led the first community wildlife habitat through the National Wildlife Federation that went on to be the first city habitat. Um, 2008 to 2023, worked with my community of heritage farms to have the first, a third overlay in the county, um, and that's about land use and conservation. Uh, 2008, 2023, um, Garden Tour Chair, Garden Tour Docent, uh, Director of Large with Palm Beach County Native Plant Society, 2023 to now, Conservation Chair, and then 2021 and 2023, Richard and I also worked with developers in Palm Beach County to actually do what was called a hybrid development. And so all of us living in Florida, we're seeing all the development, cookie cutter developments, and what does that do to us and our bees and our wildlife and everything else? Nothing good. So we worked with developers. Instead of doing a 466 unit development, we got them down to 160 gradient lots, 100% native plants, picking from 78 pallets, um, low bug lighting, um, solar rooftops, bird islands, and allowing agricultural uses, including bees. So we've been working on that, and um, it's been a lot of work. So the story of <laughs> so the story of how I became a beekeeper, and um, you know what? I don't want anybody getting horrified, but it was a different time. I'm a little bit more mature, but when I was growing up, um, I was the youngest of four, and my brother, who was ten years older than me. Um, you know, kids did back then, you sent them out at daybreak and they didn't come back until, until late at night. And so all the kids in the neighborhood would find a yellow jacket nest in the woods someplace. And of course, being kids, they'd harass the hell out of it. And so my brother would take buckets of water and throw it in the middle of the nest. And he would make me go into the nest <laughs> to retrieve the water bucket. And so I got lit up like the 4th of July and I built this terrible fear of bees. So why am I a beekeeper? Well, um, in one of my homes in, in Broward County, bees moved into an owl box. And it was fascinating and frightening and amazing and frightening. And I got to see them swarm and then the box fell and then I felt bad. And I, and I was like, this is amazing. I want to be a beekeeper. And so I needed to get over the fear of bees, for which it's taken a while, but I finally am a, no longer terrified of bees. I'm um, a fairly decent beekeeper, not a great beekeeper. I'm more of a botany person, but everything's all interconnected. So today, I wanted to talk to you about what you can do in your landscape to help your bees. And so this really applies mostly to backyard beekeepers. This really isn't about commercial beekeepers. Commercial beekeepers, for the most part, they move their 500 hives to almonds. They move it to blueberries. They wait for the Brazilian pepper flow. But 
Even people who don't want to be a beekeeper and want to help the bees, this applies to them. This can work for them. This can help your bees. It can help wildlife. It can help all of us. So anyways, we will get to our presentation, which is beescaping. All right. So first thing, we're going to talk about uh, the plants that we're going to be using. It's going to be mostly Florida natives. I certainly do like Caribbeans, and I like uh, Caribbean plants, and I like edible plants as well. Who doesn't like avocados and carambola and uh, allspice and those things? So that all works. It works for the bees. It works for us. The second thing that we're going to be talking about is a 12-month calendar of foraging. So we definitely go through nectar dearths where there's times in the summer and the winter where things are not as pro prolific as they are like when we're about ready to go into a nectar flow right now. And so as a backyard beekeeper, and if you have two, three, four hives, there's plantings that you can do, encourage your natives to do, so that there is something for your bees to be foraging on all year long. And, and encourage your neighbors to do this as well. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is our Florida lawn. So in wildflower garden, pond landscaping, home landscaping, and the average coastal home landscaping. I'm going to give you a list of local nurseries where you can get all these great plants. And by the way, Sunday, again, at 9 o'clock in the morning, we're right in Westlake Ward off of 441. We're opening up our commercial nursery. So basically, our nursery is a commercial nursery. We don't typically do retail, but we're opening it up for, for the beekeepers to buy plants, also to do an interpretive walk with Richard. Richard, again, is this amazing encyclopedia of knowledge with plants. He will just walk you through the nursery, walk you through the homestead, talk about plants, talk about the dioecious male, female, when they bloom, how, how to identify. It's really amazing. He's incredibly passionate. It's, it's, he's, you know what, he charges typically $300 an hour and you're, and you're getting this basically for free. He's amazing to listen to. Um, and also, what else? Oh, and we have another native nursery down the street from us who's going to be opening up her doors from 1130 to 1.30. So we have two local native nurseries that if I don't have something, she'll have it. So if you are looking to do landscaping or planting or give as gifts, Mother's Day is coming up. This is a great opportunity to do it. Then I'm going to talk about Julia Morton, University of Miami honeybee plants. She actually did a publication in 1966, 68. Um, she was way ahead of her time. She was a botanist. And, it, and if you ever go online to do research, she has a whole list. Richard and I are working on updating that list and expanding it. And then we're going to do the top 10 uh, plant countdown. We're going to do the top five yay, and we're going to do the top three bad, bad, bad. All right, so let's keep moving. All right, so what you typically see, and this is actually one of our neighbors in Florida, is what I call a dead landscape. What is it? Okay, it's sod. And what do we do with the sod? Well, we water it, we fertilize it, we spray it with fungicide, we spray it with pesticide, we mow it, we cultivate it to the sod gods up in heaven. And we do this every five days, every seven days, and guess what? Nothing's living on this. Nothing. Nothing, nothing lives there. The people that live there don't even go out there. <laughs> this, is, this is the absolute dead landscape. In fact, not only do the people that live there not go out there, they have metal statues of children in the <laughs> So that's how dead this landscape is. Nobody wants a dead landscape. <laughs> All right, so what is a Florida line? So we do not live in Ireland. We do not live in Scotland. The dead lawn is really a lot of work, a lot of wasted water, a lot of chemicals that harm the environment, harm our bees, harm us, and we don't need it. It's not necessary. So a Florida lawn is a mixture. It's a mixture of pretty much whatever grows there, although there are some things that are not the best things, but I'm going to give you some examples, and all of these are foraging for bees. Mimosa is a ground cover. It can be mowed. False buttonwood, spermacosi is a ground cover, it can be mowed. Richardia is a ground cover, it can be mowed. And there's no reason why we can't ha all have this. You cut it when you need to, it doesn't need to be watered, it doesn't need to be fertilized, it doesn't need to be sprayed. The bees love it, the birds love it, butterflies love it. So typically what I usually do in my backyard is I let my Florida lawn grow in the spring, late winter, spring, 
when there's a nectar dirt. And guess what? Nobody sees it because around my yard there's a perimeter planting so nobody can see in. So if you live in an HOA or an area where you're worried about the city or the town coming down on you, you can do this. There's ways to do this. And guess what happens? My life, my, my backyard is alive. It has bees. At around 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it is humming with bees foraging. It is a roar. There's butterflies. There's hummingbirds. There's insects. It's healthy. It's the way it's supposed to be. Now, probably in about two to three weeks, when the nectar flow starts, I will cut it just because, you know what, for some reason, as human beings, we, we have to do that. We have to cut our grass. And I think it's just a primitive thing to keep our surroundings safe. But if we can just get away from that and allow a little of this, it's better for everybody. All right, let me see. All right. So on to pond landscaping. So a lot of people have ponds. A lot of people live on canals. A lot of people have little places where they dug out because they had to have a house down. And basically, most ponds you see are barren. They're barren right down to the water's edge. Why? Why are we doing this? There's a lot of aquatic plants that grow beautifully around the pond, and a lot of aquatic plants that provide <coughs> nectar and pollen for our bees and for other wildlife. So this is just an example of a typical design of just say a small pond in your backyard. At the top, you would have, or close to the, the water's edge or in the water, you have pickle weed. You would have um, arrowhead. You would have amorpha, tupelo, big tree, maple tree, wild palm, royal palms. Just imagine how beautiful that would be. And if you want to see the water, keep half of it open. So you can have a vista of the water, keep the other half planted. So more communities are starting to do that. They're starting to plant in the littoral zone, and that's what that's called. They understand that it's really negative to be keeping grass all the way to the water's edge. Algae builds up because, of course, in most of these places, the grass is fertilized, and then they mow the grass into the water, and then there's algae building up, and then they get a spray, and so it becomes a dead pond. So they're understanding that this is a better way to do it. But this is also another way to provide habitat for your bees and for wildlife. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay. So again, some of the plants that I just discussed, the royal palm, tupelo, maple tree, dahoon holly. Dahoon holly is dioecious, male and female, wax myrtle, also dioecious. Swamp dogwood, it's one of my favorites. It's in bloom right now, it's in bloom at our house. It has a very unique fragrance. It smells like low tide at the Cape. <laughs> I know most people wouldn't like that. I love it. Um, another one is uh, Bastard Indigo, Amorpha. It's beautiful uh, purple flowers, button bush, pickle weed, arrowhead. And so those are some of the plants. That's what they look like up close. So you can see the Tupelo. You can see the Dahoon Holly. You can see the bees in the Dahoon Holly. Pickle weed, that would be in the water. Purple flowers, amorpha. You can see the amorpha, the bee has the, the uh, orange pollen, on its pollen sac, and then the swamp dogwood. Okay, wildflower landscape. So I love wildflowers. Um, you know, I do hiking with the Florida trails. I also do the Appalachian Trail, and part of the excitement with the Florida trails is I usually do an annual ocean to lake, which is a 62 mile hike is that you get to see wildflowers as they should be. They are in massive St. John's wort, Coreopsis, the most beautiful things. So wildflowers typically need either flooding or burning. Um, so can you do your whole yard in, in like a wildflower garden? You could, but it might be a lot of work. So what I suggest is just doing a smaller area of wildflowers because you will have to do some deadheading. They, the wildflowers don't last as long as regular plants. There'll be a little bit more weeding, but certainly, certainly you can enjoy it. The butterflies, hummingbirds, and bees will enjoy it as well. And so some of the plants in your wildflower garden in uh, Bahama strongbark, we actually have that on the table. Detropa, which is not native. Brayley, Melopia, one of the bees' favorites. Spanish needles, a Florida um, wildflower that, that's a little nasty. So basically Spanish needles, I love Spanish needles, it's edible, 
Um, the bees love the pollen. It's something that blooms all year, and so the bees do, do collect the pollen from that. It's also the host plant for the dainty sulfur butterfly, and it's also a food source for migratory birds like painted buntings. The only thing I don't like about it is that um, the seeds. The seeds are these little straight black sticky things and if you walk through it at seed time, you will have them. In fact, I usually have them all over me all the time. And so Richard usually gets fed up around this time of year and he's like, that's it, we're mowing the Spanish, Spanish needles. But it's an excellent plant for bees. So Eric, you had your hands up? Uh, yes, it's also considered by the state as a major nectar source. It is, and it's also edible. Depending on the time of year, it's amazing. It's a great plant. It is a great plant. Now, it, it is really prolific. It will spread everywhere. And again, the seeds are nasty. They'll get in your socks. They'll get in your clothes. They'll get in your laundry. This morning, I pulled one out of my, my sheets in my bed. I was wondering what was poking me on my phone. Um, but it is excellent for... Um, for our bees and for our wildlife. Salvia, Salvia coccinea, dune sunflower, spiderwort. Okay, and so that's some of the, the, so right to the far right, that's the Spanish needles. And so they're a tiny little white flower with a yellow center, and you can see that the bee has some pollen on its pollen sack in the back. The front is the melopia, that's one of my favorites. Great for hummingbirds, great for small butterflies. The bees love it. Early in the morning and late in the afternoon, we have some that kind of just rooted through in the nursery, and it's just roaring, roaring with the bees. Bahama strong bark, I really love this. This is a, a cascading weeping tree, blooms in the summer when other things are not blooming. Another one, dune sunflower. So dune sunflower would be an excellent coastal choice. The salvia coccinea, that is an excellent choice for both bees, for hummingbirds, for butterflies, for painted bunting. Uh, spiderwort, uh, that's in bloom right now. And it's funny, Sierra, who I don't think she's here tonight. Sierra, she had her, her honey analyzed and there was a big contributor of the spiderwort, the Tritoscantia, um, in, in that breakdown analysis. Jotropa is another one. Okay, so we want to have our Florida lawn, we want to have our pond, we want to have our wildflower, but we live in an HOA or, or someplace else, and you know, we have Nancy Neat, neighbor from someplace that doesn't want to see our landscape. So what do we do? How do we manage that? Well, the first thing that I do when I do landscaping is I do a perimeter planting. It's not a hedge, it's just a perimeter planting. And what it is, is high diversity, trees, palms, understory, shade, full sun. And so basically, your whole yard will be enclosed by not a wall, but by your planting. So your neighbors, Miss Nancy Neat, won't be able to see in there and complain about what you're doing in your backyard, but it's a mixture. So the important thing, and for the survival of our plants and our ecosystem and our bees, is again, high diversity, things blooming at different times planting the appropriate plant in the appropriate place. So wild coffee, it's a shade-loving plant. You'd want that in the shade on the north side. Other plants, like a strong bark, you'd want on the south side in full sun. So again, you can see the nice mix, nice combination, and that's your home in the middle, the Florida lawn around your home. You can have a pond in the back, you can have your wildflower, you can have your fruit trees, but the perimeter of your landscape is a mixture of plants. And that's just, again, just a raw design. So again, talking about different things blooming at different times, gumbo limba. So one of the things that I've discovered over the last four years with bees and nectarine is that bees prefer female plants over male plants. And so there seems to be more nectar. And so plants that are dioecious, like gumbo limbo, we have a gumbo limbo out in front of our back porch, and in the summertime, at dawn and dusk, it literally sounds like a freight train coming through. The bees are all over it. They love it. So we also have male gumbo limbos, and not as much. Necklace pod would be another great plant that's also for hummingbirds. Horizontal cocoa plum blooms in April and June. Black bee, Pithecolobium piensis. 
So that's a really neat plant because it, it's uh, like a powder puff, like you've seen the powder puff. It blooms in February and it also blooms sometimes in the fall. Jamaican caper, that's an awesome plant that blooms in the early summer. It's going to, going to, going to bloom probably, things are a little bit off this year. I've noticed some things are blooming earlier and some things are blooming later. It's, it's, you know, we had a really wet winter. So, you know, with global warming, I'm, I'm looking at the changes and how things are adapting that way too. But again, it's important to do uh, a landscaping where you've got blooming all year round. Pigeon plum, also dioecious. So we have a female pigeon plum by the house. When it's in bloom, it's roaring at dawn and dusk. Salt palmetto, so salt palmetto where we are. And, and again, if you're up in Jupiter or if you're down in Boca, things might be off by a few weeks because it kind of just gradually starts from the north and comes down to the south. Um, our our salt palmetto right now has flower spikes, but it's not in full bloom. Crabwood, I love crabwood. So crabwood's another one where the bees just, just, just love it. Uh, firebush, Simpson stalker. And again, I brought some samples and I'll go into more details about them when I'm at the end. Simpson stalker is a great hedge. So if you're in a community and want things a little bit more formal, you could do some sin stopper. Now part of the, the trick with trying to keep a hedge, don't trim it when it's going into flower. <laughs> let it bloom. You know, at the very least, let it flower. And the flowers are so fragrant, they're amazing. Wild coffee, a good shade plant. Avocado, so again, edibles. I'm all into ed edibles. Live oak, even some vines. So we have some vines that we're selling um, one of them is one that you can't find anywhere. It's called Christmas vine. And let me tell you, that thing blooms right on cue around Christmas. And, it come, and the trunk of it, gets, it, so it can be aggressive. <laughs> the trunk of it can get to be probably three or four inches. There's white tubular flowers. It's in the Morning Glory family. The bees are all over it. And this is a time right after Brazilian pepper when there's nothing else in bloom. And I don't think you can find it there. We actually ordered seeds from Puerto Rico and we started growing it, but the bees love that. Um, Skyflower, Jacamontia, it's another one. Red tip cocoa plum. Uh, Pavonia, Pavonia is a great one. Batch palm, star fruit, another edible. Carambola, so that's one that's blooming in times where other things are not. Willow bus stick, so uh, Brad. I had done some work with Brad. He loves willow bus stick, so his bees love willow bus stick too. They always give me a kiss when I go and visit him. Um, bitter bush. And so here are some of the pictures. So bitter bush. Bitter bush is dioecious. It's male and female. And so when I'm doing landscaping, it's not just about wildlife. It's not just about the bees, but it's also it has to be pleasing for us too. It has to be attractive. So bitter bush is dioecious, male and female. But the female has fruit in the fall, and it just hangs like a bunch of grapes. Really ornamental, it's beautiful. It grows in full shade or sun. It grows narrow, does max out at maybe eight feet. So it's a good choice for tight areas. The strawberry tree, the mentingia, that blooms, it has an extended bloom period, and the bees really like it. The fruits are edible. It's not my favorite, but um, a lot of people seem to like it. Uh, swamp bush, Pavonia, Bahamensis. We have a native one. We have a Bahama one. Uh, bees really love that. I've had a lot of people tell me that it was covered with bees. Saw palmetto. We already talked about that. Wild coffee. So that is a really good plant because people are always asking, what can I grow in the shade? So wild coffee, and there's, let me see, how many different varieties of wild coffee? You have the velvet leaf, the shiny leaf, three. Three different types. The velvet leaf actually blooms middle of summer, the uh, Cypotria nervosa, the shiny leaf, it has an extended bloom period. It blooms from about ready to go now into about maybe June. Um, and it's also just one of these plants that's really exciting to have because it's in the shade and we, it's hard to find things that grow in the shade and produce nectar for our bees. All right, and that's to the far left, that is the black bee. Remember I told you it looked like a powder puff, the Pisisolobium. So that is that was blooming in February when nothing else was in bloom. My bees were really happy about it. Jacamontia, that's a really nice behaved vine, not like the other Christmas vines, it's not well behaved. So this one's very well behaved. Uh, thatch palm can grow in full sun, full shade. 
The ornamental part of it, it has little white tiny berries and in a dark shade, it's gorgeous. All right, so not all home landscapes are the same. We have uh, out west, we have center, and we have coastal. And so a silver buttonwood on the coast is not, is going to do great. Silver buttonwood out west is not going to do great. So you definitely have to change the dynamics a little bit, and the bees will be nectaring on those plants out coastal as well. So fiddlewood, Jamaica caper, sea grape, um, let me see, uh, buccaneer palm, all those are great examples. And again, doing a perimeter planting. So nosy Nancy cannot see in. Paradise tree. Paradise tree is dioecious, male and female. Although I did find on my one of my hikes in the um, ocean to lake, I found a paradise tree in the Loxahatchee Slough. I was just so tickled, jumping up and down, and everybody thought I was nuts. Um, but do you it was have exciting. A picture of that one, Melissa? Um, um, I do not have a. I don't think I have a picture. But let's look at the next slide. I might have it in there. So they're male and female uh, buccaneer, or I'm sorry, paradise tree. The females. They're just finished flowering, so there was an early bloom. They bloom a little bit earlier than everything else. And on the females, again, more bees than I see on the males. They're followed by these fruits that almost look like, like orange quarters or discs. Really, really pretty, really ornamental. Lignumvites, another great coastal. And our lignumvites, if we're kind of pushing the limits, we have it around our house just because we have a high raised uh, house pad but they're going into bloom now. The bees love that as well. All right, so there is a paradise tree, the picture to the far left, to the left. And so those seeds are not fully developed yet. They're just starting, but they're really pretty. But you can see it has the, the opposite leaves. Um, really pretty tree. Like inviting in the center. And on the far right, that was actually a client of mine that's more coastal. She lives in Atlantis. And um, her bees were all over her lignum vitae, all over the horizontal cocoa plum, all over the buccaneer plum. She doesn't have bees. So I put a swarm box out. <laughs> Within 10 minutes, uh, bees came to her swarm box. She filmed it. This is a woman who's 75 years old. And in the caption, she's writing, holy. <laughs> so <laughs> she couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe how fast they came but they were in a very happy place and it was all because of the landscaping and probably those very little competition. So there's a gumbo limbo to the far left. It's one of my favorite trees. They call it the tourist tree because the bark resembles uh, flaking burnt skin. That's outside our kitchen window and so every sunset I get to see this beautiful orange glow on the tree. That's also the female that when um, it's in bloom and so you can see the next picture below it. Those are the flowers. They're teeny, 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 tiny. So bees don't like the big bang, whatever you want to call that, in your face. They, they are looking for food. It, it doesn't matter to them whether it's a giant flower that's six inches wide and bright orange or purple. They're just looking for their food. The flower in the gumbo limbo is teeny, 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 and the bees are thrilled with it. The next plant over is the Jamaica caper. Um, I did not bring one tonight, I thought I did. And so the Jamaica caper, I love that. Um, it blooms in spring, early summer, and it starts off in the morning as white, kind of has an orchid flower, it's fragrant. By noon, it's a light purple, and by afternoon, it's a dark purple. It's absolutely gorgeous. And then uh, cocoa plum, horizontal cocoa plum to the far right. You can see the bees on it. Okay. And then Simpson Stopper. I did bring an example of a Simpson Stopper. I'll talk more about that later. It's one of my favorites. Sable palms. So our state tree is, is sable palms. And um, I don't know why people don't plant more of them. They're hurricane resistant. Um, you can see those are ruddy dagger wings in there, but the bees are also in there. They bloom in, in the summertime when there's a nectar dearth. It, um, they have boots on them. You can put orchids in them. They're, they're an excellent choice of a tree. They're drought tolerant. Um, they can deal with flooding. They, they plant them on the coast. And so, again, planting throughout the year. Because we live in Florida, we also want to think about hurricanes. So we don't really want things that are going to be blowing over in our house. 
So Richard and I, we bought our house next to the nursery. It's a two-story house. First thing we did was we ripped down our ficus hedge and our areca palms, and we brought in 22 field-grown sable palms because it's a two-story house and planted it around the perimeter of the house. When I lived in Broward in Coconut Creek, I had uh, sable palms around my house, and when Wilma came through, my roof was the only roof standing in my neighborhood. So my landscape, it lost all its leaves, a few broken branches, but guess what? My house was intact. About a month later, my landscape just bloomed right back out. It never looked like anything happened. And this is because it's a native landscape. All right, so nurseries. We have, in, in Palm Beach County, we are privileged to about eight native nurseries. And I do want to add one to the list that's not up there. Um, his name is Dennis with Sustainscape. He's in Boynton Beach, if anybody wants his address. He also sells fruit trees. Um, so he's right off of Boynton Beach Boulevard, and I think he's east of Lyons, but he also has native plants. So uh, Native Choice, they actually, he did change his address. He's out west now, and it's by appointment, but you can still call him. Indian Trails. So she is our neighbor. She is no more than a three-minute drive from us. She is going to be open on Sunday from 11.30 to 1.30. She will have plants that I might not have. She's opening specially for the beekeepers, and um, she's, she's amazing. Meadow Beauty, he's by appointment. Southern Native Nursery out near Loxahatchee in the acreage. There was some rumors that they were selling. I'm not sure what they're doing. Um, but you do have choices to find this stuff. It is available, it is here, call first. Uh, native plant people are a little bit funny. They, they don't want you just showing up. You do need, they, they're, they're just, they're, you know what, I used to think that the beekeepers were um, a unique bunch. <laughs> the, native, the native plant people are doubly unique. So um, make sure you- Quirky? Um, fickle. <laughs> So, but, but they are also very knowledgeable and they will help you, you know what, there's just a polite etiquette, call first. All right, so that's that. And again, uh, Sunday we are opening up our house. We don't do that often. We are typically a commercial nursery. So um, this is kind of a rare treat. You're gonna be listening to Richard. You're gonna be getting into our bees at the apiary. I've got amazing plants for sale. 10% of the proceeds go back to the club. Um, trying to think what else. Yes, you got fun. All right, Julia Morton. So I did mention her briefly. Look online. She has a publication. I can't imagine. I can't remember how many pages it is. Richard, was it 20, 30 pages? So she was. She was an amazing woman. She was far ahead of her time. She gives descriptions of the plants. She gives the the nectar flow, whether it's abundant or sparse. Um, she talks, she gives a lot of detail. So we're working on updating this. We did contact, it was the, what, the Historical Society, and we are gonna be updating this and adding to it. Um, and she covers everything. So it's not just native plants or edibles, she covers ground covers, she covers everything. So anybody who's also interested, look on that, look online, it's a great resource. Okay, and now we get to do the fun stuff. All right, so my top five favorites. And so this, this is Simpson Stopper, and I love this, I love this print. So the leaves, they smell like, um, like a citrus and gardenia. If you crush the leaf, um, there's little oils that come out, so it's kind of insect resistant for insects to eat it. Uh, the leaves are tight. If there's, you know, it grows, genetics are genetics. And so some of them grow short and bushy. Others grow into a tree form, almost like a standard. It's got a peely bark. The flowers are a long flowering period from spring to early summer. They're really fragrant. It smells almost like a gardenia, a spicy gardenia, followed by little orange fruits that are edible. You can eat them. I, I prefer to leave them for the migratory birds. If this can be sheared if you have to, if you feel like you have to be uh, Nancy Neat and keep this squared and trimmed, you can do that, it's happy to do that. 
drought tolerance once it's established, so that's nice, less water, lower water bill. So that's, that's one of my favorites, and it's funny because I noticed in this pot there was a white stalker that volunteered. So at our nursery, uh, sometimes you get um, two for three or one for three. So sometimes when we what see was little the name volunteers. Of that? What was the name of that? I'm sorry. So this is Simpson stalker. So we allow little volunteers to, to grow because you know what, I just, we love our plants and I don't have the heart to pull them out. So like this one is a little Silotum nudum. This is a whisper and this is not for bees, but this is really cool. It's a prehistoric plant, but this is wild coffee. And so why I like wild coffee? Well, it's got a beautiful shiny leaf. It grows in full shade. Um, the flowers are a long bloom period from spring to early summer. Also, really fragrant. So I, I like the fragrance. Richard doesn't like the fragrance, but you know what? He likes things that smell like cat pee. So I don't, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and you know what? I love him. I'm not bashing him. He's French. What can I say? So, <laughs> but I like it. It smells like a gardenia to me. He doesn't like it. I think it's awesome. Also followed by little uh, red, dark red berries, which is great for migratory birds. But the bees love this. Yes, sir. Or on a sandy soil. Uh, this would not be the best thing for a sandy soil. Um, you know what? So a lot of people, they want to push the limits. And I'm, I'm trying to get people not to push the limits. So if you're in a high rise by, you'd have to water this every other day for it to be happy. But you know what? I, I The next plant over would be for a full sun, high rise spot that's very dark tolerant. So I will find you what you need. I'd rather not have you water a lot and waste water and just work harder, work easier, and find the right place for the right plant to your place. So this would be a little bit more shaded. They are drought tolerant once they're established, but not, not a real dry, sandy spot. Definitely not happy in full sun unless it's a wet spot. So like a swale that's, that's seasonally wet will do well, depending on where you live. So like I live out west near the um, Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge. Fatima here in the front, she lives out in Homeland. It would work. Our water table's one foot down. If you were living East Lake Worth, maybe next to an air conditioner on the north side of the house, underneath a shade tree. So the next plant that I like is Melokia. This the common name is gray leaf. So this blooms all year. Uh, the height of this, and I'll, again, so the heights of these, I'll, I'll give you some examples. So this can get up to 18 feet, 16, 18 feet, Richard, or more. <laughs> um, it can be a hedge kind of thick to the ground, or it can be a standard or tree. Wild coffee, 8 feet, 8, 9 feet maybe, 5, maybe 5, 6 feet. So it's a little bit less. Malokia, now this is, this is, to me, it's funny, when I was setting up the chairs tonight, Richard noticed, he's like, very Welsh, very European, you're spreading them out far, and so typically, people put the chairs on top of each other, so I'm more like this plant. I want a lot of space. I don't want anybody next to me. I don't want to be in a community. <laughs> I want full sun. I want to be left alone, high and dry. Don't overwater it. Water it to establish. But this will get to be about maybe eight, nine feet in really good conditions by five, six feet. Blooms all year. Hummingbirds, smaller butterflies like hair streaks, atalas, bees definitely all over it and it doesn't want to be in a community. So don't, don't plant it with everything else and then say, oh, it died. Well, yeah, it's gonna die, because I've told you, it wants to be by itself. So one of our wildflowers, and so I love our wildflowers. Some of them are more longer standing than others. Um, some of them reseed themselves and they come back. Some of them um, are always there. So this is goldenrod, and so I love this. This is a fall bloomer. So it blooms uh, after Brazilian pepper, mostly, sometimes it blooms before. Plants are gonna do what they want, so there really is no rule, it's almost like bees. And what I love about this is they've got beautiful yellow flower spikes that can go up two or three feet. You will see bees all over it, you will see butterflies all over it. The best way to use this plant is in masses. So I would be planting a big group um, in the front and then another layer and then some other things in the back but this is a beautiful plant for bees and butterflies. Um, 
Bahama Strongbark. So this is one of my favorites. This is a summer bloomer, and the reason why I like this, this gets to be you know, between 16 and 20, 22 feet tall. I like this because it's kind of got this weeping look to it, almost like a um, weeping willow. So I'm also from Massachusetts, by the way. And so it kind of has that cascading look about it, and so a lot of our plants down here don't have it. In the summer, it blooms in the summer when other things are not blooming. It's got about a nickel-sized flower that's very fragrant. Bees love it, butterflies love it. Um, I once had the um, mayor of Coconut Creek come to my house in Coconut Creek and we just sat in a swing in August and I had one of these and she was looking over and there was probably about 20 different species of butterflies all over it. Mm -hmm. And so it blooms in the summer all the way up until Christmas and then it's followed by little orange fruits that the birds like. I've also seen uh, uh, spot-breasted Oreos hanging upside down, hummingbirds in it. So this is a, another one of my favorites. So the no-nos, the bad, bad, bad. All right, we're gonna talk about the bad, because you know what, again, so we talked about the dead, dead lawn, let's talk about the dead landscape. So the, the, the new, I'm gonna talk about the old fad, and then I'm gonna talk about the new fad. So the old fad was Brazilian, was the um, ficus benjamina. It was easy to grow, it was cheap, it made a nice hedge, everybody loved it. Okay, so this is from Asia. It, it, it can be 100 feet tall, 60 feet wide. It doesn't do well with hurricanes. It was horrible. I hate ficus. If I had a customer that wanted ficus, I'd say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. So it's a terrible plant. It does nothing for wildlife. It does nothing for human beings. The root systems can go for miles, infiltrate your toilet, your pond, your septic, your neighbor's swimming pool. It's a nightmare. So when we got spiraling white fly, I was so excited. I'm like, oh, thank God. Yay. Okay, get rid of the ficus benjamina. I hate it. And so I was hopeful. I was really, really hopeful. But then the next beast came along. And so this is the current beast. Yes, the current beast. So this is Clusia. This is not Clusia rosia, our native. We have a native Clusia rosia, which is a native which is a coastal plant. It's a tree, the signature tree, the autograph tree. This is Clusia fluminensis. It's from Brazil. It has aggressive root system. It brings nothing to our wildlife. It does not go through hurricanes. It does not like wet feet. This is a horrible, horrible, horrible choice. It's killing me to see this be the new replacement of ficus benjamina. And so why, why, are, why are our bees native and um, honeybees not doing well because we keep planting garbage like this. Why are we doing this? Because it looks nice. Are you kidding me? So it's a nightmare. If you have it, rip it out. If your neighbor has it, tell them to rip it out. So what would the other one kill us? So the native one is a trait. It's a trait. So you know the reason why they're using this, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. This is the, the era that we live in. Is people are saying, oh, this is a native. They found it in a nursery. It was a hidden stock. It was a cultivar. No, 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 and more no. And so. <laughs> I'm glad I can entertain you, Lee. <laughs> How do you really feel? Oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> Let me flog you with it. So, so it, is, it is a bad, bad plant. Um, it is not our native. The native one is a tree. It's a tree. It's not a hedge. You can't propagate it like this one. This one, you know what? I could throw this out in the ground, and it's going to root. You know what? Anything that does something like that, you know, beware, beware. This is going to be the next disaster. So, so, so what do you have? So we have, you know what? We have horizontal cocoa plum. That's the perfect plant, horizontal cocoa plum. Guess what? It doesn't grow much taller than seven, eight feet. Exactly what people want. It's drought tolerant. It can deal with wet feet. It can deal with some shade. It's beautiful. It has little white edible fruit. You can make jam with it. It has the round, gorgeous leaves. It can be full. If you put on horizontal cocoa plum into your internet, you're gonna see a picture of our front yard because we did a native plant tour at our place. I don't know how many years ago that was. I don't know, 10 years? And, and so there's a picture of that that comes up. 
That is one of the replacements. There's numerous replacements. So I'm the conservation chair for the Native Plant Society, but I've been really busy doing a lot of other things, like protecting our natural areas that developers want to get into. So I haven't had time to do a list of what is a good alternative and to educate the public that this is a bad choice. We're going to pay for it later. People are, people are so excited, and, and it's really sad. Every nursery is growing it by the thousands. Really bad choice. It's, grass, they can sell it. it's cheap, it's easy, right. Yep. So, so left on its own devices, it can grow up to 30 feet tall and what, 20 feet wide? Mm -hmm. And so I just found something interesting uh, online and I need to verify it, but I, I was looking to see what the pollinator of it was. Male cockroaches. <laughs> isn't, isn't that what we want? Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to tell the people in Palm Beach. Oh, yes, you planted for male cockroaches. <laughs> right. So yes, yes, that's the kind of wildlife I want in my yard. <laughs> All right, and last, you know, there's a lot of bad things, but this is a Rika Palm. I hate a Rika Palm. I hate it. I did landscaping for one of my customers. He thought he got a good deal. He brought home, like, I don't know, 25 seven gallon Rika Palms. He's like, Melissa, what are we going to do with that? And I said, throw in the trash. <laughs> he said, no. And I said, yes. And, I, and he's like, well, what am I? I said, go see if they'll take it back. So he went back, and no, they wouldn't take it back. And I said, go see if they'll take it back at half price. Nope, they wouldn't take it back at half price. And I said, listen, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. You pay now, you pay later. And if you pay later, you're going to pay dearly. So Arika Palms, they're messy. They expand. The roots are horrendous. So you plant them, oh, look how easy they grow. Well, before you know it, they don't like cold weather, they don't like dry weather, they get yellow leaves, they have very little wildlife value, and they are becoming an invasive pest plant. They are spreading everywhere, they're horrible. So even in my house in Coconut Creek, I had both the ficus benjamina and the rica. Before I even moved in, those things were ripped out and thrown to the curb. I had a neighbor, can I take them? Absolutely not. So, no, <laughs> they're garbage. This is garbage landscape. Don't, I wouldn't even put this around a, 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 a garbage container. It's horrible. So, Arika Palms, another thing. I hate them. Very little wildlife value. They just keep expanding. They get wider and wider. I had a client in Boca. They had this tiny little backyard. They had Arika Palms that came right up to the edge of the pool. The kids couldn't even get in the pool anymore. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you bad news. The bad news is you're going to tear these things out. It's going to cost you a fortune before you can plant what you need to plant. Cost them a fortune. Then all of a sudden, they had a backyard. And we planted. And they loved it. So Arika Palms. I know, I know it seems like the right thing to do because they're cheap, it's a palm, I like that look. Horrible choice. Bad, bad, bad. And I think that's about it. And if anybody has any questions, please. Thank you. So it's interesting that you say that. I do grow the other type, and I do have them for sale on Sunday. So the question was, is that the native coffee, do we, is, is there an advantage to growing the other type? And there is. And so I actually did some research on the other type of, of the edible coffee that they're serving back there, which is phenomenal, by the way. Thank you. It gave me that boost I needed. I'm going to buy a bag before I leave. It smells so good. Zombie coffee. It is. It's excellent. So we do grow. Um, we do grow the other one. You know, I, I love plants. So I'm always going to be playing with things and learning about them. And I like to eat from my backyard as well. Um, so I found out with the other coffee is it's interesting. So it does produce nectar. The bees come to it. The bees love it. The bees get hooked on the caffeine. And they, become, they become coffee addicts. And so the plant is smart. Well, I don't need to produce more nectar because you're an addict. You're going to do what I need you to do. And so the nectar 
the only purpose for that is to be, get pollination. So the bees keep coming back and they keep getting less nectar from the plant, but they still keep getting pollinated. So I do have a couple of those for sale on Sunday. They're beautiful plants in shade. They do well in Florida. Um, but yeah, so it's an interesting story that definitely there is um, nectar from that plant, but the plant is working smart, not hard. So it's getting done when it needs to get done. How well, how well do they transplant? The coffee? Yeah, the wild coffee. So, you know, transplanting can be tricky. Some things just don't transplant. Like horizontal coca palm is not a happy transplanter. Coffee, it depends on how long it's been in the ground. If it's a seedling, um, you can probably just, you know, right away when you pop it up, put it right in water. Two seconds is too long. Okay, have a bucket of water with you, dig it up, put it in. If it's been in the ground a while, the best thing you can do is do a hard cut. Cut it back really hard because you don't want the plant sustaining these leaves. A lot of the energy, you want it producing a new root system. So you want to cut it back really, really hard, dig up a nice root ball around it, move it. Have that hole ready for it. Again, when the roots are exposed, they're not happy. So have that hole ready to transplant it. Dig it up, put it in, water it a couple of times a day. Even put a drip system on it. And it should do fine. It, it, it transplants fairly well. Are um, pine trees in any way good for beans or So I love pine trees. And so, you know, our slash pines are, are amazing. And so, you know, our yards, and I know I'm speaking to the beekeepers, um, but it's important to have high diversity and to have ecosystems. And so I would say this, so pine tree is not necessarily the best thing for bees other than the pine needles is our fuel for our smoker. And also saw palmettos and other plants that are good for bees normally and naturally would occur together and they have a symbiotic relationship in the roots, in the soil. And so there's nothing wrong with having a slash pine. Slash pines don't like people. They don't like foot traffic, they don't like fertilizer, they don't like irrigation. And it, so if you have a beautiful slash pine, the best thing that you can do is plant a wild coffee, plant a beautyberry, plant silver saw palmetto, plant myrcene, and keep a nice community around it. Mulch it with pine needles, don't irrigate it, and don't fertilize it. And who doesn't want a landscape that you don't have to work hard at? So yeah, there's nothing wrong with having some things that are not just about bees. Um, bees like to swarm into them. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. And again, we need the pine needles. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny because uh, Fatima has bees in her place that are mine, and her bees like to swarm in that slash pine that's about 40 feet up and then just water right. and nothing I can do about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so that's why we put up swarm traps. Yes. Uh, so the Bahamas strong bark is native, and as far as the propolis, the tally would probably be the expert about the pine sap being used for propolis. I think that Vitali said that there's not a lot of propolis in Florida, so I don't know. Go ahead, Vitali. Time. So you as a professional landscaper, yes. and people that have green thumb, yes. which plan do you recommend for the keepers, which doesn't need too much attention? So again, it depends on where you live. So most of these are all along that. It depends on where you live. So I'm not going to give you the best plant. You need to tell me where you are. Are you on the beach? Are you out west? You know, is it full sun? Is it full shade? Are you somebody that waters all the time? Tell me, tell me what you're all about, and I'll tell you the perfect plant. So most of the plants that I recommend are, are low maintenance. My husband and I, we have 11 acres. We only have two full-time employees. Most of the work is done by us. So yes, I do not want to be killing myself every single day. Um, we're a little bit more relaxed on our landscape, and why not? We enjoy it. Where, uh, or oh, okay. How, how old, do you have any luck with your tupelo this far south? So, you know, tu so we do. So we actually have three different varieties of tupelo. We have swamp tupelo, we have ogeechee tupelo, 
and yeah. and what is it? Water, water to blow. And so they bloom this year. I didn't see it, but they're dioecious. They're male and female, and there's fruits all over them. And so the what was it? The um, not the ogichi. Which one is the one in the nursery? The biflora. The Ogeechee okay. biflora. So the Ogeechee biflora, the swamp tupelo, it blooms earlier. And then the, um, the Nissa, the Ogeechee Nissa, is the one that's famous for the tupelo honey. It blooms a little bit later. And so ours have bloomed. I mean, are we pushing the limits? Yeah, we're pushing the limits. It might do better maybe in Martin and Jupiter. It wants, a little, it, wants it wet, um, a little bit more acidic soil. But, you know, Brad, he bought another piece of property up in northern Florida, and he took a whole bunch of um, tupelo with him, bare root, and they're all lush, they're all leafing out. He's going to have a tupelo farm in no time. So, yes. Yes, Sam. What's edible in the Spanish needle? The leaves. Oh, oh yum, yum. Like so, or do you have to cook them? So you eat them raw, like a salad. Sure. So, you know, it's funny. Um, Roger Hammer, who is one of the uh, uh, a botanists down in Florida, he just came out with a, a book, Foraging Florida. And so that's an excellent book on night. So look that up. But yes, you can eat the Spanish needles, the foliage. It's, I don't know, it's, it's a greenery. So is, is it like yummy? No. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's healthy. It's, yeah, I guess it'll fill you up if you're starving. So, yes. We do have papaya trees. Yes, we do. And so bees, so papayas have tubular flowers, and they're male and female. And so uh, sometimes what bees will do, because obviously they can't get into the, the, unless the, the nectar is dripping out, sometimes bees will rob plants. So they'll actually drill a hole by the base and take nectar out that way. They do that with partridge pea as well. Several different um, plants will do that. They'll just rob it at the base because they can't get in there. So fire bushes like that too. Yeah, and let you know unless there's like this big flow of nectar and it's dripping out at the tubular flower, they'll they'll try to rob it. And in fire spike, I've seen them do that with fire spike as well. Fire bush. When we uh, meet up on Sunday, yes, sir. Could you uh, break it down for us? Like a group is from Loxahatchee, a group is from the coast, and make those recommendations for us. Uh, with pleasure. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> because my short end ain't what it used to be. Uh, <laughs> Are we going to have access to this maybe on the on the website? Um, so this presentation. Yeah. So that's up to the powers that be. Yeah. It would be great. Okay. So the powers that be will make that decision. Yes, sir. What about freight Ah. Thank you. So you know it's funny. Are they native or not? So they're not native. Um, you know this this is something you know just kind of blows my mind. The landscape architects when they they put these in, they put them all in at schools. When school's out, they're blooming. And then the rest of the year, they drop their, their leaves. They're, they've gone uh, they to the leaf exchange. Bees, no? um, I have not seen bees on them. I have heard from somebody who lived in the Orlando area that said that they did. And this locale, I have not. So bees are kind of funny that way. If they think that they're like, like we are. I would prefer a lobster over I would prefer uh, a hot dog. So if there's lobster available, I'm going to take lobster and, and leave the hot dog elsewhere. Okay. So for the first time working between grape this Okay. So again, you know what? Even like uh, elderberry, sambucus, rarely see bees on it. But if there's nothing else, they might be going after. You know, the way that I, I think that is an awesome plant for bees is when I hear that roar. When they're roaring, I'm like, whoa, they're really loving this. You know, when they're just kind of like, oh, I'm starving, I guess I'll have to do it. You know, that's not like something I'm going to say, yeah, that's a good plan for, for, for bees. Mm -hmm. yes, what about palmerias? Um, no, not really. Not palmerias, no. no. So I, I've never seen a bee on palmeria. Have you, Richard? Hawk moth. Yeah, hawk moth. Yeah, but not, but not honeybees. No. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's kind of it's kind of con so it's a it's a conflict of interest for me. I am the conservation chair for the Native Plant Society. The vice president sitting right here, or the former president. So I don't want to be um, tarred and feathered at the next meeting. Um, okay. It's in base. So it is a Category One invasive pest plant. What is um, that? So a category one is no, I mean, what plant was she talking about? Bra Brazilian pepper. Oh. So Brazilian pepper. So it is a category one invasive pest plant. They're dioecious, male and female. Um, I don't allow any of them to grow on our property. Do my bees benefit from other properties? They do. Is it something that I would encourage people to grow? I would not. Do I understand? I do. I get it. I'm a beekeeper also. Is there a good substitute for it? If we plant it in the masses, we would, there is, soapberry. So soapberry blooms the exact same time. The bees are all over it, foraging on it. So let's remove all the Brazilian pepper. Let's plant all soapberry. <laughs> and problem solved. Are they less invasive? Soapberry is a native. So, but you know, again, it's, it's I'm talking to the beekeepers. I get it. You know, we're you know we're, we're looking to have healthy bees. Commercial beekeepers are looking to sell honey, sell bees. I understand. You know, I'm not going to grow it or allow it to grow on my property. But I understand the appeal, and I understand the plant. And you know, biocontrol has been released, and we'll see what happens with that. We'll see what happens. So. Do I encourage people to be happy about it? I mean, again, it's, you know, I, I get it. You know, I have friends up north that love the Brazilian pepper honey. It's like, <laughs> I like the spring summer honey, but there's people that like it. It's food for our bees. I get it. So, so well, Dehoon Holly blooms at a different time. So it's not so much the looks of the fruit, it's the same bloom period, and the same bloom period, knicker bean. Knicker bean blooms the same time. So if you hate somebody, you hate your neighbors, you don't want people cutting through your yard, plant knicker bean. You might find them hung up there the next morning. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's an excellent coastal plant. We actually have some growing on our road roadway and it's funny across the street there's vacant property with Brazilian pepper it's the same blue period time and I see the bees foraging in the knicker bean see the bees in the Brazilian pepper um, soapberry is another good alternative so if you're looking to get away from the category one invasives soapberry soapberry knicker bean knicker bean good replacements for that time of year all right any other we, questions uh, the rest of your questions thank you Questions, please, on Sunday at Ask Melissa. Please come back and ask the company if you have any questions. We do have to run this up because uh, we've got a raffle to run.